Hello and welcome to another edition of Inside Sources. My name is Laulu Akonde. First, my take for the week. You will remember two weeks ago, we had raised the issue here of the rising insecurity in the country, especially with what happened in the FCT, where kidnappers went to uh, uh, an estate to arrest members of the family. Since then, we must report that the security agencies and the government have been making some efforts. We have seen the setting up of the Special Intervention Squad, which we advocated for. This has been done, and it is commendable. We have also seen the arrest of a number of certain kidnapped suspects, and this is encouraging. But the situation is no less there. Several other cases of kidnapping and other forms of insecurity are still all over the place. And so today, I want to suggest that the time has come for the former proper establishment of state police in the country. Only on Wednesday in Guzo, the capital city of Zamfara State, the governor of the state, Governor Dauda Lawa, led other Northwest governors at a widely attended rally presided over by retired General Ali Uguzo, the passing out parade of what is called the Zamfara Protection Guard. It speaks to the imperative of local policing. Before that time, we had seen the rise of Amotekun in Southwest, Ebube Agu in the Southeast. And after the Christmas Eve attack in Plateau, and by the way, another sad event in Plateau recently, the governors in the North Central also came together with the idea of having some kind of local policing. Therefore, it is very clear that for across this country, the length and breadth, everyone seemed to have come to the conclusion that state police is going to be a better idea. It makes sense. With all the insecurity in the country, we can no longer have one commander of the police in Abuja directing what is happening in the Talisi states of the country. The time has come to give that authority and the power in the states to the state governments. Now, this has to be done properly, and that is why we are calling for a proper constitutional amendment that will define how this will not be abused. And it's also important for all the stakeholders to come together and ensure a proper rules of engagement. The time for state police is now. And so we are calling on the president, we are calling on the governors, we are calling on the members of the National Assembly and the State Assembly to set the ball rolling. And we are also calling on traditional rulers, religious leaders, and all leaders of thought to come behind this idea of state police, but to ensure that it is done in a way that it delivers efficiency and does not encourage abuse. That is the next thing to be done. And we hope we will not lose this opportunity. And that is my take for the week. Inside Sources will be right back with our guests for this edition. Welcome back. Today, I have two formidable Nigerians as my guests as we move along on the conversation on the future of Nigeria. Uh, they require very little or no introduction. I have here with me Aisha Yesufu, uh, a social media influencer and political activist. Aisha, you are welcome to Inside Sources. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. And also we have uh, the presidential candidate of African Action Congress, Omoyeli Shuore. You're welcome. Thank you very much for bringing me. Thank you so much. So the first question as we open this conversation is, what do you think about the current trajectory of the country as it is today 
do you think that we are going in the right direction? Let's start with Aisha. Ah, that's, I don't even know where to start from that question because there's no country anymore. As we are today, Nigeria is gone. What we have is a carcass and uh, life is short and brutish and everyone, we're all on edge. We are the victimhood that a lot of people refuse to see coming to us, we are all there. And unfortunately, uh, we do not have a president. We have someone who rigged his way into office, an illegitimate president, and who doesn't care? And of course, anyone who is ready to do anything, you know, snatch it, run with it, and all of that to get into office, they don't care about the people. They don't care. There's no empathy. And that's what we're seeing today. And Nigeria has gotten into a place where you're not even sure that you're going to see the next day, because you might be a victim, might be taken away, even from inside your own house. And uh, that's where Nigeria is right now. Mm. Okay, so as an opening statement, yeah, sure. Well, you know, you asked about trajectory, and if we are going in the right direction, uh, and I say we are not going in any direction, that's the biggest problem. Uh, you can only tell about direction if there is, you know, uh, from a geographical point of view, there's any kind of movement. Here you see a lot of motion, there is no movement. And if there's any movement at all, it's a movement that is going backwards. And Nigerians or Nigeria is paying heavily for both their decisions and their indecisions. Mm -hmm. Their decisions in deciding for those who decided in this trajectory, on this trajectory and the indecision of those who did nothing. And that's why you cannot say, and I agree with Aisha, that you have a country today. Uh, we've never had a nation, I have argued this all the time, that Nigeria never, was never a nation, it was a transaction. Uh, from the beginning. And that next step is what we haven't been able to make because we never also have had the kind of leaders that are visionary, that are capable of driving you in the right direction since I have been a Nigerian, which is uh, 1971. Mm. Well, okay, I mean, so, so it's a very nice way to uh, get into it. Now, let's, let's get deeper into the issues, you know. So, Aisha, there, there, there is the, the notion you know, that uh, of the rule of law, okay? Now, even though we can always point to challenges, because you did say that the president is illegitimate now, after the Supreme Court has ruled, you know, you still don't accept that in the circumstances you have a, a sitting president in the high of the law, even with whatever uh, problems we have with that? I think uh, to answer your question, you saw the last ruling that happened uh, of the governors and the Supreme Court and how everybody was praising Mr. Tinubu for the fact that he didn't interfere and they were able to retain their, that tells you everything. And as I'm sitting down here today, I'm quite sort of like taken aback that the Supreme Court didn't see how that made them to look. Because right now what we know, and that's, that's the secret or the open secret, that the courts are no longer the last resort of the common man. They are now like the plaything of corrupt politicians. And these corrupt politicians, they don't care. And they're saying it, they say it openly. We've seen all of that. We saw the uh, uh, Senator Bukatua, what he said. And so it's not about me accepting it or not accepting it. It's war, it's on ground. We, rule of law is sacrosanct. And it's supposed to be on everybody. Right now, we've seen the different kind of decisions that have been made by the courts. Mm. So the way, the way it goes, the court itself, it, there's no independence. We have judiciary capture, we have media capture, everything is, there seems to be, even the legislative capture, it's on that sort of like one party, one person doing whatever they want to do with it. And at the end of the day, every Nigerian is suffering. There's something many people say, they say Nigerians don't react. That no matter how much you push Nigeria to the world, they don't react. They say Nigerians are reacting. The people who are killing, they are reacting. That's their own form of protest. Their own is an illegal form of protest because the legal form of uh, protest, they've clamped down on it. They've stopped people from doing that. And every one of us is suffering because there are some people who no longer see any hope. Because when you go to the courts, and if you see a lot of people that have given up on the nation, they know even when they go to the courts, they won't get anything. Mm -hmm. So they take the laws into their hands. And the rest of us that are law-abiding are the ones who are being punished by the state. The Nigerian state would rather, you know, have a conversation with you, negotiate with you when you carry arms against the country. But when you are law-abiding, it clamps on you, it kills you, and it just disposes of you the way it wants to. Mm. Interesting. Okay, so um, so let's let, let me let me take it to uh, Shore. Basically, both of you have the same view. Not that I'm surprised, but it's it it makes it quite exciting. So, what is 
the way out? Is there a legitimate path, you know, out of this trajectory? You know, I'm, I'm going to start with Shore and then we'll come to Aisha. I, I think any way that saves people from the doom and destruction that has become their lot is legitimate. And I say this so that people are very clear about where I stand on Nigerian issues. Uh, earlier, I agree with uh, Aisha that there is no country. Mm -hmm. Where I disagree or differ from them and their party was their own brazen um, hope, <laughs> I call it brazen, that the judiciary was somehow going to deliver differently in the 2023 election because it has been very clear from the election, from the primaries at the party's level, the conduct of INEC, that they were not planning an election. So when the elections were over and there was this eye on the judiciary, I was wondering which eye, you know, which judiciary are you eyeing? Because I, I understand the judiciary right from my university days. Mm -hmm. I have been expelled, went to court, judges did not deliver justice. So, but where I agree with her is the issue of legitimacy. You see, something can be legal and be legitimate. Mm -hmm. A human being can be born as a legal human being. Mm -hmm. But the process of bat might be legitimate if it doesn't go through what is legit. So I agree with her that the, and you have a right to reject a system or a president that did not come legitimately as it's been decided by, or should ought to have been decided by the rule of law. Mm. Uh, but we're not dealing with a country that respects any laws. The laws here are like cobwebs. They are mm. only meant for ants. Mm. And, you know, the elephants walk past them without even knowing them. So it's a country that is created for two categories of citizens. And that is why I have always advocated, and I'm never afraid to say, that something massive, something urgent, and something revolutionary must happen in Nigeria for us to change course. This course will continue, you know. They have already rigged even the next election, if we go by how they have populated INEC already. You know, in the U.S., where you and I spent some years, if one person was going to the Supreme Court, the country will shut down. Mm -hmm. There will be conversations. They will go and look at where he was standing when he was in primary one. Mm -hmm. If he was backing the flag or he was in front of it, if he plucked somebody's coconut, mm -hmm. you know, if he took somebody's eraser. Here in this country, there were over 11 Supreme Court judges that were just smuggled into the Supreme Court. And nobody talked about it. In fact, the media did not talk about it. The public are not aware. Nobody knows who these new judges are. Nobody did any background checks on them. So in four years, you're going to have election. The person who anointed those Supreme Court judges, 11 of them, as we speak, controls what we call, what you would call justice. Mm -hmm. And this is not going to change, except the citizens said, no, enough is enough. We are not taking this any longer. And that is why I advocate for a revolution. Not a violent one, because I don't believe in violence. Mm. But it is up to those who are hurting to decide how they want to fight this. Mm. OK, in interesting point. So, so uh, as I bring it back to, uh, to Aisha, Aisha, you, 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 you supported the uh, Labour Party presidential candidate, mm -hmm. you know, which suggests to me that you probably have the uh, belief that we can change it through getting uh, some people in government, you know, is that your own approach to try to fix the trajectory that you think is not right? Yeah, so for me, absolutely. Um, political activism is very important. Staying out of politics and saying that, by the way, I'm not a member of the Labour Party. I say a lot of people make that assumption. I, I'm, I'm a supporter because I believe in, in candidacy more than mm. I do of, of party. Mm. If you have people that can do, can do the work. As much as activism and politics, the, the end result is supposed to be for the greater good of the people. Where those who are on the side of advocate and like, this is the problem. Mm -hmm. Then those who are in the political side who get into office, who get elected, you know, right. fix the problem. So right. is that, you know, demand and supply side of gov governance that Dr. Obi Ezekwesli uh, would always talk about. And so for me, it's very important for people to begin to participate. We have to participate in that politics, mm -hmm. as flawed as, as, as it is. Yes, I totally agree that the capture of judiciary didn't start today. I mean, we saw mm -hmm. in 2015 when the Supreme 
Supreme Court said that the, the card reader was not admissible in the law. Mm -hmm. And those, that sort of like changed the course of all the, you know, the electoral reform that was done uh, at that time. So we've seen a lot of things uh, that, that, that have gone on. But we must still continue to take on the system. One of the things that we, we don't take into cognizance is the fact that the first set of dictators that many Nigerians, or if not all Nigerians made, were actually from the home, were parents. Mm. We're, brought, we're brought up in a society where, as a younger person, you can't speak up. You don't speak up to your parents. You don't challenge them. You don't ask them, why did they do this? You'll be called disrespectful. You'll be called a, a stubborn child. Mm. For those of us that did as kids, we got a lot of be uh, beating. So, and then people went on. Teachers also continued the suppression and people became adults, and they simply replaced uh, their parents' teachers with government. Mm -hmm. So some people feel that, oh, you can't challenge government, you can't do that. So it's going to take a long time. It's a mindset thing mm -hmm. that will happen. But the thing is that it's inevitable. Like Shawari said, of course, it's, the bloody revolution is always the best. A bloody revolution doesn't take anyone anywhere. You either have a, it, and it's inevitable, we either have a bloodless revolution or a bloody revolution. The 2023 uh, election was actually a bloodless revolution where people who hated to had never bothered about politics, were never interested, they didn't think it was, they, they didn't see the relationship between governors and their lives, decided mm -hmm. that they were going to be part of that uh, uh, political process. And they were part of it. And at the end of the day, the process was not allowed to go through. The end result is not what matters. It's the process that matters. Mm -hmm. If the process was free, fair, credible, and it was transparent, and the result is still turned out to be the way it is, everybody will move on. It's mm -hmm. every four years. You have another four years to come through it. But where people see how their will was subverted, because when you have a, a, a political coup, a civilian coup like what we had in the 20, with the 2023 election, it's the same thing like a military coup. So the world needs to also uh, see that. So but on the issue of the political, this, it's very important. If we say today we have a revolution, let's always ask this question, we have a revolution today. Who are we going to put in these offices? We need to begin to create leaders. We don't have leaders. We have a vacuum because people have stayed away from politics, looking at it as it's dirty. Let's not do it. So we just have people, people get money or one thing or the other, the next thing they run for office, they get in there without any preparation, without even knowing anything. You see someone, they say, oh, come and run for be president. I'm like, you don't just become president like that. You have to. There are certain things, there are certain competent uh, skills that you're supposed to acquire, leadership skills, empathy, you know, uh, your EQ, IQ, and all of that along the way. So so we must begin to engage in that process of that politics and say, okay, let's get into it one way or the other. Yes, it looks difficult. If we don't have the revolution, a revolution, nobody can call for a revolution. That's one thing. It has to happen on its own. Did they always say to be when that revolution will happen, we'll all see ourselves on the streets and we'll be saying, ah, even you brought you mad day here, mm. sis, you mad join us. That's the way it will go. But until we get to that stage, can we begin to prepare sort of like that leadership so that we have a set of uh, a critical mass of people that we get into leadership position and actually serve the people, not the ones that we get in there, and then they'll begin to do what we're seeing today. Because most of the people who are in leadership today were actually the ones who were fighting for this democracy, okay. were the ones who were fighting for human rights, but they got in there, they became, they, 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 from baby monsters, they became gigantic monsters. Okay, good. Let, let, let's, let's go back to, uh, to Shore on the same point. So Shore, you, uh, I mean, you've been the presidential candidate of a political party, you know, that means you also succumb to the idea that partisan politics can 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 help fix the so in in, in that wise, what, how do you intend as a politician? How do you intend to use your party to change this? So I wanted to make it clear okay. that when revolutions happen, people make them happen, and you can you call for it. Mm. Every country that's had a revolution, there were people who were working towards it. That's what. It's in history. It is what triggers it that I may not have a date, she may not know the date. Uh, it's very interesting that after the 2023 election, most of people who said revolution was a bad idea were calling for revolution. They are still calling for it. Some of them were calling for a coup plot. Yes, mm -hmm. because of the election. I also want to correct the impression that, you know, 2023, in my view, actually didn't have, it had enthusiasm but low participation. Mm. In the history of the country, the number of voters in 2023 were probably some of the lowest. If you look at the number of registered voters compared to the number of people that went out to vote. Maybe there were new, there, there were more there new were, yes, voters. Yes, yes. So, because people have started losing faith in the political process before now. Mm. You're talking about 2015. 
in 2007, and you and I were covering this uh, from the U.S., mm. the Supreme Court decided, first it was the Court of Appeal, that you don't need, uh, what do they call it, serial numbers for the ballot papers. Mm -hmm. And as a result, Yahadua became president. I had to apologize himself, mm. <laughs> being what they call a good Muslim, that I know I didn't win the election, but let's move on. So this process did not start today. But what has been happening is that those who are manipulating the process have been growing in impunity. And I want to address the issue of where the leaders come from. Mm. We cannot claim that people are not, you know, we are not producing leaders. What has not happened is that some of the best leaders in this country have not been given the opportunity or have not created the opportunity to lead. You know, you cannot claim that after my 30 years of being an activist from the university to creating media to doing some of the things that are impossible, even living abroad, I, you know, I consider I that, you know, education and leadership mm -hmm. development. You can't claim that Aisha here, who led a major movement to bring back our girls. It's not ready for leadership, no. See, when the revolution happens, when the vacuum is created for good people, you'll be surprised at how many leaders we have who have just been suppressed in their various fields, who are depressed, who are compressed. Mm -hmm. They will be unleashed on society. Some of them will come from abroad. When I was doing the election uh, campaigns in 2018, I met Nigerians who are tunnel engineers in the UK. They are the ones building the tunnels that the trains drive. You have a Nigerian doctor who brought out a baby for the first time in history, fix the baby and put it back. How can we say that the country don't have these leaders? But as long as you keep putting, or these guys keep imposing themselves on the system, you, those potentials will never mm. rise to the surface. And the last part I would address over this issue of leadership is that even the struggle to bring mm. about a better society creates its own leaders. But we must not forget that the number of people that fought for democracy mm. compared to the number of people who have transited from that era to the new dictatorial era she's talking about, but there are very few, mm. very few, you know. And you can argue, and I've argued this before, if some of these guys who are now in power actually fought for democracy if they weren't fighting for themselves. Considering that the period of the democratic struggle, mm -hmm. the most difficult part of it, some of them were selling drugs abroad. <laughs> so how can you be fighting for democracy and engaging in crime? So this is what we have found out. So if you do the maths very well, you discover that they have the real democratic leaders have not transited. And this is a conversation probably for another day. Mm. And that is why some of us went and created parties of our own. Because Chief Ghani Fawimi created one in 1994 when it was not uh, mm. even acceptable to create a party. Part of the reason I participate in the political process is also to throw off uh, the contradictions in the system. So that the more of those of us who are outliers participating, the more the system is on that belly, it's exposed to the public. But if you leave it for them, which is what we did in 1999, by the way, mm -hmm. we, we fought for democracy when it was time to transit, we all left. I left Nigeria in 1999. By the time I came back, they had blooded Ganifa and me, fell and tried to be governor of a kitty. He lost in a way that mm -hmm. nobody has ever mm -hmm. lost. They ridiculed everybody. Real pro-democracy activists were ridiculed. But the fake pro-democracy activists got into power. Mm -hmm. Yes, from 1999. So we, we should not consider those ones as the real face of the pro-democracy movement. Because most of them weren't fighting for democracy. Mm. Anyway, you know, I mean, it's, let, uh, let me let me just yes. figure off uh, from what he he he's, he's talked about right. in the 90, uh, 1999, which is I totally agree with him. The people who really fought for the demo, for democracy they didn't mm. participate in it, and that comes to the question where you're talk, talking about political process. There are a lot of people who just feel that oh. Uh, people shouldn't participate in the political process. And that's wrong. Because what happened in 1999 was that those who actually fought for it thought maybe the military were not going to go away or something. They left. And that criminals, yes. criminals entered. And by the time those criminals, a good number of them were, were it even the, were that fake. They, mm -hmm. they were criminals because nature mm -hmm. abhors vacuum. And then they got in. By the time the people who were actually pro-democracy came back, they couldn't get them out of it. Mm. So that's one. The other thing I just want to quickly talk about is on the issue of the register. When we look at the percentage, 
The 2023 election, we had very small percentage, but we could see there were quite a number of people that came out. One of the things for me, and I think, and I might be, I might be wrong, and I, I want to be proven uh, whether right or wrong, is the fact that with the 2023 uh, election, incidence form was not allowed. So people, there had to be that accreditation. If you're not taking mm. it, then you can't vote. Right. Unlike what we had before, where this is, even with the card reader, incidence yeah. form, politicians will have a way to just bring up these numbers. Mm. Another thing also we have to look at is that register itself. Is it really the number of people that are there? Because what we had earlier on before, politicians used to, you know, register multiple. One person we have like forty something cards, a hundred cards, mm. because they use it to, uh, to, to, uh, to how do I put it, to just uh, inflate their mm. numbers. Mm -hmm. But now it's uh, not, and then we are now having an issue. And that issue also comes to us in the fact that when we want to recall lawmakers, the law says you must fifty percent. Mm. Meanwhile, it's not fifty percent that send the person to to the, either the National Assembly or the State House of Assembly. So there are a lot of things that we need to fix. And unfortunately for us, the, the, the one uh, legislative arm of government that is the bedrock of democracy in Nigeria, that is supposed to have, that is supposed to be more powerful than mm -hmm. the executive, has actually found itself to be less powerful because the executive have money and they use it to just tie them or there's a capture of it all. So we need to have all of these systemic changes going on. We are why we're waiting for that revolution to happen. Let's also have a political revolution like he has done by running uh, for office. Let's continue to have that and get more people in mm -hmm. there. Okay, Somehow I mean, we get yeah. it work. Excellent. So, so in my view, uh, I, I think that... Um, uh, reforms of the of all these different institutions, you know, could be useful. We could talk about judicial reforms, talk about political reforms. But let's talk about judicial reforms, you know. Uh, and, and this is not a subject, of course, that is only uh, left for for legal luminaries. You know, the people have a, a stake. What kind of judicial reforms would you think uh, is ideal? For instance, you know, there, there have been an argument that why well, look the people that are that end up in the Supreme Court, for instance ought not just to be uh, uh, people who are judges. What about law professors or distinguished lawyers? What is your home or what are your ideas around judicial reforms in such a way that can give us the Nigeria that we expect? You know, let's start with uh, Ashwa. Yeah, let me come to Ashwa. I've said it and I keep saying it. Nigeria has passed the stage of reforms. You, you don't think that don't, any, don't any think reform that is useful? The, I don't think that the current set of people yeah. in Nigeria can reform the judiciary. Let me give you an example. In the last three years, uh, I've been stuck in Abuja, no? and there were 62 vacancies in the various courts what? in Abuja. Out of the 62, I think 60 of the new judges were children of former judges or their relatives. Are you talking about the federal court or the, uh, the, the court? federal court? I'm talking about the FCT court, okay. you know, and the magistrates. You know. So they have cornered these places. It's not going to happen that the place can be reformed by the people who are benefiting from it. That's why there has to be an eruption. There has to be a whole the, eruption the, of the... The problem the, with eruption yeah. is the disorderliness of it. And, you no, know, no. And, and to the extent... You are, you are, we, are already, we, we, are, with, we are already in a state of disorder. This is chaos. This is anarchy. You know, anarchy is defined as a state of lawlessness. If you are delivering judicial pronouncements in which you give a public pronouncement, and by the time the people who are victims of your pronouncement came to collect the CTC, they discovered there's a difference between what you pronounce, as they did in Kano, mm. and what is in the CTC. That is anarchy. We are already there. Yeah, but I'm, but I'm saying so that. The, if, are you saying that those things cannot be fixed? We, we can, we can gonna, identify the who's, problem. Who's going to fix it? The people, so, by the people coming out, organizing themselves, making demands for specific you reforms. Can't, they, you can't make demands if, to people who are deaf. These guys are tone deaf, mm -hmm. and they have they believe in their own impunity. They have the police, the army, who are ready to kill you if you make mm -hmm. these demands. If you make peaceful demands, they'll kill you. They, like she said, the mm -hmm. only people who can make serious demands on Nigerian government are people who are armed to the yeah. teeth themselves, yeah. who are involved in the same level of impunity and uh, violence as Nigerian state. Mm -hmm. Those are the only people they listen to. So. And those people don't make this kind of demands. Mm -mm. They don't believe, they don't go to the judiciary. If they kidnap someone, they are asking for ransom. It's not a judge that's going to deliver the ransom. If they have enough ransom, and you put them in front of a judge, the judge will let them go because the judge will collect part of the ransom. I will tell you something that's happening now. All the people they found 
They said they were found with money in the last regime. They are pleading with them to drop some of it. Reason is that they say if we take them to the judges, the judges will collect the money. We won't get a dime. That's what I heard is happening with the regime. So if I've gotten to that level, where thieves are so powerful that even prosecutors are afraid to take them before judges, the country is already in a state of anarchy. So the disorderliness you are talking about is here with you. If kidnappers can kidnap freely, daytime, nighttime, that is anarchy. I think the order in Afghanistan is better than the order in Nigeria, as we speak today. Even though all of us were free two years ago that Afghanistan is going back to Taliban and you know they'll kill everybody there. I've not heard of serious violence. In, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not advocating that we should have a Taliban here mm. or government of any, but I'm telling you that this is total chaos. The chaos that can only be envisaged if there is no governance, if there is no order. You okay. Know? Okay, uh, so, so where we start from is that, you know, you don't fix something that is not broken. So when you're talking about reform, reform means that, you know, there's something that is not working mm. and you need to fix it. Yeah. The people who are supposed to fix it, it's working for them. So the state that we have right now, and that's, that's what uh, Shawari is also talking about, it's working for them. They are enjoying it. So there's, there's no reform that they will be looking at to make in terms of judicial reform or any of that, the set of people. And that's why we need to have the kind of people that will focus more on the nation rather than on their own selfish interests. And what's part of the thing he also said, how do we even get these judges to be judges, the magistrate and all of that? How do they get in there? What's the process that they seem to get? And the CJN also, like the office of the CJN, there's too much power mm. in that whole office. And uh, the, the only way we can get that, the legislative arm, of course, that will be able to help us to do that, they can't. They won't do it because it's, it favors them. They'll be able to use one thing or about if the people insist in. and put pressure on the legislature to do the right thing. So the people, so that, that's also like what he said. The people insisting, how do they insist? They insist by coming out and voicing. They insist by protesting. They insist by, but you know what? The Nigerian government always behaves like a terrorist government. When people come out on armed citizens, they kill them. We saw what happened October 2020. Young people were singing the national anthem. They held the flag of Nigeria. And yet, the Nigerian state went there with military and kill them, not only kill them, still gaslighting them. It never happened. So how are people supposed to come out when they are being killed when they come out? And then the only people that the government is ready to listen to are the people who take up arms against the, against the state. For law-abiding citizens every day, you see the way they dehumanize you, the way they come out, they kill you. They are doing an election, they are bringing out election results. They brought out military tankers all over the ICC building. All over. But where are those military tankers when ki kidnappers are taking our children and killing them because the people didn't pay ransom? They are nowhere to be found. The only, the, the, the Nigerians, the security agents, uh, agencies in Nigeria, their allegiance is always to the president, even if it's an illegitimate one, and the ruling party, rather than to the people of Nigeria and the constitution. So that's a big, a major problem that we have. People want to protest. They come out to protest. They are being killed. So there's nothing out of it. And this state that we are in now, and if we do nothing, it's going to worsen. We have religion keeping people down. We have, they will use tradition, they will use all sorts of things to tell you not to speak out. But people are being killed, and then people are being told that, inshallah, it won't be them, in Jesus' name, it won't be their portion. I wonder the people who are being killed, whose portion it is. If we do nothing, Every one of us, we are all victims waiting to mm. happen. Yesterday's victims were one survivors. Mm. Today's victims were yesterday's survivors. And tomorrow's victims will be today's survivors. The people that have been killed will not be killed again. Mm. The next to be killed are those of us that are alive. And Nigerians need to understand. Mm. This thing is not, we're not going to wish it away. We don't have the patent to prayers. We're not going to pray it away because God will not do for us what he has given us the capacity for us to do for ourselves. Fixing Nigeria, God has given us that capacity. So if we lack and do nothing, I will stay in our houses and we keep praying, then this whole thing we continue and it's not going to end. We're already on the path of chaos. Mm. So it's just not left for the people to decide. Are they going to stand up against the people who have held this country ransom? Because there are few of them. Mm. And if we come out in our numbers, of course, we will get that country that we mm. want. But a lot of people are afraid. But something we give that we mm. break that fear and nobody will call for it, like I said earlier. The people we find themselves mm. on the street. Mm -hmm. Beyond the protest, which is important, there are times when we, you know, but in, in terms of 
you know, working with, within the limits of the law, you know, since we are not going to break the law, you know, we're mm -hmm. not going to ask people mm -hmm. to break the law, mm -hmm. you know, both of you have considered that. What else can we do in getting the critical mass of our people mm -hmm. to be educated between now and the next election, to be empowered? You know, so, so I mean, I, I, I take all the points about, mm -hmm. you know, they are not going to change it, people moved, mm -hmm. you know, people get, got involved in 2023. But apparently, there seems to be a little bit more space of what can be done in trying to engage the people on a long-term basis. Tough love. That, 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 uh, that's what I'm saying. I, yeah. I, I, I want to say this, and I think it's important to make a philosophical statement around the law. If the law keeps breaking the people, the people might need to break the law so that they can break free. Um, apartheid was legal in South Africa. But it was breaking South Africans until they broke it. Uh, slavery was legal. In fact, not only was it legal, slavery is also uh, ecclesiastical. It's in the Bible that you should respect your master. But when slavery was breaking people, people had to break the law of slavery. So if the Nigerian law keeps breaking the Nigerian people, the Nigerian people may need to break the part of the law that keeps them broken all the time. And that is why I keep advocating mobilization that do not come only during elections. Mm. In other serious countries, if elections are rigged, the person who rigged the election cannot walk away. You get my point. Yeah. And I had the issue with the Labour Party and uh, where Aisha was with. They mobilized. They also were demobilizing when they should keep mobilizing. I don't see any reason why they sat back after it was known that there was, I said, I know there was no election. But whatever they believed took place. And they, whatever, they ought not to have stopped there. There ought to have been complete mobilization and the shutdown of the system. The system was ready for that shutdown. But then they said, hey, don't fight, don't fight. They're not going to get power on the platter of gold. Don't let anybody deceive you that somehow, because those who are, I, I those, those who are in power. The president said that himself, that power would ever yes, be those who are, Yes, those who are in power will keep giving you homework assignments, and you know, homework to do. Go and mobilize, go and mobilize. We're talking about political parties. Very soon, they will come and register political parties so that they can register political parties that will do they are bidding. Or the, register, the political parties, they cannot register, they will go in there and scatter the party. Because what they want is a one-party state. It's a dictatorial one-party state. Do you think a one-party state can survive in Nigeria? I, I don't think so. Well, this, all the parties so. that are in Nigeria that are in power, that have been in power, yeah. they are all one. It's just different yeah, uniforms. Different, <laughs> different addresses. So, yes, it's just different uh, national headquarters. I went to because the, to Nigeria the is the only country in the world where you can sleep as a PDP <laughs> member and wake up as APC. So, well, let's, so, let's, so, so let, let's talk the about... The ruling party is one party. Yeah, let's, so let, let's talk about political reforms. Yes. You know, um, because, look, what we have is what we have. We have a constitution, you know, that is guiding we us. Don't, I don't believe we have a constitution. The well, constitution well, that was imposed on us is not well, our constitution. I mean, that the, was a the, military constitution. But the, the point of the, fact, uh, yes. of, the, of the matter is that for whatever, it, regardless of how it emerged, but and, it I also have, and I, I also have issues with the way it yeah. But hey, that is the law it matters. today. It matters. And, and, and we can use it, I believe, that we can use the constitution, we can use the law to make some changes. You know, even if you think it's minimalist, you know, so... For instance, on the issue of political reforms, do you think that Nigeria will be better if we have two parties, two options, you know, and with proper ideological uh, uh, segmentation differences? Let's start with Aisha. Well, in a way, it, it, it will be better, it, depending on also how it is done. If, it, if you have a situation whereby people are being denied getting mm. into those parties or being, if there's no internal democracy mm. in, in, in parties. And so you find a situation whereby maybe two parties, they're just dominated. I think we almost like had something like that before we, we got yeah. to where we now had all of this. But of course, a two-party system would work where everyone is allowed to get in there. There's internal democracy uh, being done and there's rule of law, no imposition, no trying to mm. buy judgments, trying to use the, the law to just get uh, things away. That, that would sort of work. And, and, 
and the, the most important thing, it's not even about what, what the number of parties we have, is the kind of people that are allowed to emerge within those parties. At the end of the day, Nigerians will only vote for the people that are flag bearers of parties. And most times what we have is that most parties, they do not give their best. To, to, to run the tickets to run. They give it to those that are, that are not competent enough and that they can control mm -hmm. because they know they want access to the treasury, mm -hmm. access to the wealth of the people. So yeah. if you have someone who is not very competent, whom you can, you saw what happened in Kogi State. I mean, we, ha we now have an office of the immediate past governor, no, someone I, who is saying, don't I, obey me, obey. You know, those I, kind I of things. I think they deny that. I think they deny that. Uh, so someone who is saying, <laughs> they deny that? Whenever they deny something, they just know it's true. <laughs> and then <laughs> saying, OK, on, and all of those things. So what we need to what, what we need to have is, first of all, have those systems where it's the most competent that I imagine. If we have a situation in Nigeria where we all have competent candidates, it's only a matter of ideology. Mm. I mean, a lot of people can go, go and sleep. You only need a little or bit of critical mass to be keeping eye on what is happening in, right. in terms of governance. We can all continue to go and do our businesses. So that is where the problem is. It's not even about the number of parties, but the fact that people are not allowed in. And sometimes also, like I said, you find a lot of these parties, they don't make it open. They frustrate people who want to get into those parties. And of course, people who have jobs that they're doing, they're not going to be staying there and, and fighting tooth and nail mm. to be able to get into certain parties and, and do as, as, as some of these things. But at this moment, what we as Nigerians must understand is that politics is now we fighting for our lives. Because true politics is where you get governance. Mm. You don't, we, we're running a democracy. So right. it has to be through the political process, well, no, no matter how flawed it is. Yeah. And so we must not take it upon ourselves that we must participate in this thing and mm. come in mass and say, now we must begin to change this, this whole thing. And like what, 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 what he said, keep mobilizing on the fact that we all come out in mass. If you don't do the right thing, we, we, will over, we will overrun. So that at the end of the day, let's know if we're going to have a country, let's have a country. If we're not going to have a country, let's not have a country. It's not fair that some people have their families protected with all our security agents. Because we go to different houses of either elected officials, VIPs, whatever it is, they all have uh, you know, uh, security agents guarding them. What about the rest of us citizens? Who is looking after us? So we, people need to get to that state of mind. And I think also there's something else that we don't. We, we refuse to allow people people realize the relationship between governance and their lives. We play government, we play, we play God, mm. most citizens. So you're always helping. We, we think we can crowdfund our way out of insecurity, crowdfund our way out of poverty. Mm. We're always taking us people's problem. We want to solve it for them because, of course, you were told to help your neighbor and all of that. And more and more and more people are abdicating their responsibility to you. They are allowing government to abdicate their own responsibility of taking care of the welfare of the people, and then more and more pressure is being put on order. There must be tough love. People must understand. If you don't vote the right way, if you don't come out during an election, if you don't participate, mm -hmm. or more, when you are hungry, enjoy the hunger. Don't put it on somebody else. All right, George. Oh, well, uh, I think what democracy is about is uh, the beautiful thing about it is that it allows for. Uh, multiple choices mm. for people. So I don't think we have too many parties. However, I think we need to have a law that allows for independent candidacy. Mm. So that people who don't want to be part of the shenanigans of these political parties mm. can run without having to deal with those things. I know of a presidential candidate during the last election, 2020, each time the party leaders are broke, they write him that they want to withdraw him as a candidate. <laughs> so he'll send them money. You know, the following week again, they'll go and meet somewhere and say, you know, we, we don't want you to be our candidate anymore. You'll send them money. Because like she said, most of the party leaders don't have a second job. You but know. that's not a major party. Where they have <laughs> Well, it was, it was a major party. Wow. Uh, yes. Uh, you know, there were only 18 parties in this last election. So mm -hmm. it wasn't like the 79 parties in 20. 19. So it was a major party, but that's how they operate. But if there were rooms for independent candidacy, it's people who with ideas who don't want to participate in the dirtiness of politics can come out as candidates, organize themselves, and you find out that a lot of independent candidates will even organize better than the political parties. Mm -hmm. Because then they can find people who align with their objectives, their vision, and their narratives about how to fix the country, who will not say, well, the leader of the world has suspended you. 
Mm. You know, when you are a presidential candidate of a party, like they did to Shio Mole, they went to his ward. The people at his ward did not even know his what name. Was <laughs> they didn't know he's the chairman of the party. But these are some of the things they do. Mm. So that, and I also think that one added advantage to the whole process of democracy is to allow the aspirants to vote. vote. Diaspora voting will also put a lot of pressure because. You have six million Nigerians, and they can leverage. They can even out six million Nigerians outside. outside. Mm, that's right. And those six million Nigerians are not going to ask you for, you know, bread mm. or Ankara or some kind of. They can mm. afford to take decisions that is not influenced by all this. But, but uh, I'm sure you and you can't use guns on them. Also. Yeah, and you also they are protected. The yeah, you know. Units. Well, it depends on where they are. There are Nigerians <laughs> in certain places that. If it's required, they will send people mm. down there. But well, that, that's my there. point. Yeah. Yeah. I right. believe that there are more than 6 million Nigerians in Nigeria who will behave like those 6 million Nigerians abroad. The question is that how do we get them to be involved? That's, that's what I'm saying. There are, there are 6 million Nigerians that's in this country who, candidates. who are that free. So you, you, you have Aisha here. She's, she's supporting a candidate but doesn't belong to the party. Because she doesn't want to be part of the party. It's possible that it's because of the reputation of the party, mm. or because she believes in a candidate. She believes in a candidate, but doesn't believe in the party. So, imagine if she has a totally free platform where she can operate freely and decide on a candidate without having to deal with the party. That changes the dynamics a lot. Mm. So there are over. I would say there are millions of Nigerians who will be participating in our political process today if they did not have to if they don't have to deal with political mm. parties. Yeah. Mm. Because they see the political parties as special you know purpose vehicles for corruption and dirtiness and immorality. But they want to participate. And a lot of people a lot of Nigerians just don't like politics. Period. Okay. And they see the parties as symbols of, of uh, political decadence. Okay, good. I mean I, I wanted to make a point that, you know, I think the three of us agree on the, the, the usefulness of independent candidacy. You know, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Right. absolutely. Now, let, 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 let me throw another But idea. we should be careful. If you allow them to make the law without pressure, you discover that there is no person who can act as an independent candidate who doesn't have a billion naira or several billion naira somewhere. They will put holders in advance so yeah, that, that is where only them can also become independent. That, that is so where they, will, they will now start raising independent candidates themselves who will become their opponents. <laughs> so we have well, to be also know, careful. I, I and agree, be I agree about that. But, but at least, you know, in, in terms of principle, we, we think that uh, independent candidacy is useful. Let Absolutely. me bring another idea. You know, and of course, you know, we can talk about what has to happen to make sure that you get what we really want. Yeah. What do you guys think about parliamentary system? And, and this, is, this is what I think. I believe, first of all, I think that the presidential system is unnecessarily expensive. Yeah. But more importantly, I believe that the presidential system creates a situation where Mr. President, whoever it is, can sit in the villa without coming out to explain or be questioned. But in a parliamentary system, you have to sit in the parliament face to face with an opposition leader, and you have to take questions from the opposition, and all of this done in the public. I think that can help our political process to become more accountable. What do you guys think, Aisha? Okay, so so for me, uh, uh, straight off, I would say that we we are not doing the presidential system is there. We are not doing true federalism. So that's the thing about Nigeria. We have all sorts of things. We don't. If we, we copy something, we are doing it. We are not doing it very well. Mm -hmm. But I totally agree with you. For me, the parliamentary system works better for me. In the in, in the sense that it's less expensive compared to the presidential system. And if you have like ministers and all of that, you're not going to be bringing in new people. Mm -hmm. They're all lawmakers. It's you know first yeah. among equals. They are all sitting down there. They are all lawmakers. Even if they remove you, uh, probably as a minister or something it's like that, you just go back there. Yes, you're yes. there. You're sitting down there. You continue uh, what you're doing. For me, I think it's something uh, that, that would work better than what we, we currently have right now. But the thing is that whatever kind of system that you bring in, if you have the same kind of people who are ready, who are not, who are not accountable, because rule of law is everything. Mm. Even the parliamentary system that is working in other countries, the way it's working, if you bring it out to Nigeria, they will rubbish it. They will find a way to do what they want to do. If they don't want to talk to us, they won't. They will, tell, they will even publicize it. They will say they won't meet. And if citizens are sitting there, if those are not doing anything about it, they get away with it. Because at the end of the day, absolute power would Always corrupt, uh, absolutely. Uh, abs absolutely. But on my oh, personally, I, I I am more interested in the parliamentary system. system than I am of the oh, uh, presidential sure. system. 
I, I think for a federal system, and for a system that is as diverse as Nigeria, mm -hmm. I'm still, I still prefer the presidential system of uh, government. Those who practice parliamentary system are usually societies that don't have our kind of diversity. So, and also population is also very important. The reason why we opted for presidential system is because it has layers and layers of government. You know, you have a local government, you have state government, and all of them have parliaments. I think if our problem is that it's too expensive, there are things we should do immediately. I personally don't think we need bicameral legislative system. You know, mm. I think Nigeria should be okay with a Senate of 109 people. Or house, of, or house of rep. House of rep is even too expensive. Okay, because of the number. Yes. Let's have 100. I used to think we should have house of rep and all, but at the end of the day, they, all of them combined together are not doing anything. They don't even go to work. Everything. Even the thing that they have, the electronic voting system, they deactivated it because they don't want people to know how they are voting. Mm -hmm. Not because they don't want people to know that. It's because they also don't come to work. These are things that, that, that people should become aware of. Yes. And so, be mobilizing so, so, and pressurizing so, on. So first, get they rid of the bicameral legislative system. Let's have 109 senators. Mm. All right? And let them represent, you know, there are mm. different mm. constituencies. Just a minute, yes. so, uh, do, you, do you agree, Aisha, with, with, uh, with the bicameral? Oh, I, I, yeah, unicamera, yeah. Oh, sorry, unicamera. I, yes, I, I, I totally agree with him. It's so, what we have is too much. So if you have a unicamera legislative system, you can also always, you see, it's, it's the, the parliamentary system that brings the president or the prime minister to, it's the same we have here. These people are also supposed to bring the president whenever they want. But they don't do it mm. because the of... The thing is that under the parliamentary, the, the prime minister is a member. And he's going to I be understand. faced every day so, of his life in government by the opposition so, leader. But here, like Aisha rightly told you, if we bring it here, they will take the parliament to the president's house. <laughs> yeah, right. And they will close the door. I, I, I tell I you, know, I don't think they're having a plenary. It's bad. It, yes, it's, really. worse. It it's worse. You know, no, it's, do you it's know, worse. Do you, do you know how your legislator is voting in the National Assembly? Mm, exactly. No, you don't. Yeah. Because it's not transparent. But the information is, is public. You can find out. It's not, you can't find who out voted how they are for voting. Who? Who. You know the general. The law, you can have what, a general idea yes. of. But when they want the to do the voting, it, the names you know, the who thing is that there's supposed to be an electronic mm -hmm. register in the place. You place your finger on it. It says you don't have control over the results. In fact, the public is supposed to be seeing it in the US. Mm. It was, they, they will call the name of the person, his uh, constituency, he will vote. You will see the mm. thing there. There's a TV station that is 24 hours, CISPAN, right? Yeah. In the US. Here, you don't know who voted for which law. Well, I think and most of them also don't show up. I think it's important to begin to call out the leaders of the National Assembly. Don't we call them out every time? Them say every time. <laughs> that you cannot How many they times shut can down the National well, so, Assembly. So, so and this, all of that. The, the, because those are the areas that we can get to do something on it. So we, la, we, let, let me call. Let me call. We can't la, change, la, la, we can't change me, the me, game me. without changing the players. That's it. That's let me it. let me call me. Uh, I think was it last year when they, they had those five gender bills yeah. that the National Assembly threw away. Mm. One of them, as little as a woman that is married to a non-Nigeria, let her be able to confer Nigerian citizenship mm. to her husband. Yes. It's not too much. They threw everything away. Women were outside the National Assembly for over 30 days. Mm. And some of them made fun, like, oh, when they are tired, they will go oh, away. Yes. So that's what they always say. It's, it's, uh, is it closed now? So I mean, open, open NAS was done, a lot of this. So they keep saying this, go, go yeah. away. And you know, at the end of the day, they will bring in security agents that will kill everybody. And even the security <laughs> agent, then later they'll be crying that Nigeria is bad day too. They are being this way. Yeah. Well, all of us are suffering. Because people watch the, the whole space, the civic space, being shrunk, being attacked, and they said it's none of their business. But today, it's all our business now. Well, you know, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's been quite exciting having this discussion, and I wish that we could, we could go on and on, because there are indeed uh, things that can be sorted out, you know, and there are things that, you know, we require much uh, uh, difficult handling. Uh, but I want to thank you both for coming, you know, uh, and, and to say that it's important that your voices are, you know, co continue to be active and raised oh, absolutely. around the important issues of the future of Nigeria. And I'm hopeful uh, that we will get it. Now, last question. Do you guys have hope that we will get that Nigeria of our dream? Just, you know, 10, 10 seconds each. 
Oh, absolutely. We'll get that Nigeria of our dream. Nigeria must work in our lifetime. And we are not giving up. Giving up is not an option. And the thing is that we keep going and we'll get that nation. It might be impossible, like, but like Nelson Mandela said, it's impossible until it is done. done. And we will get that Nigeria. Thank you. Jore? I, I don't think we should overplay hope because that's what put people to sleep. I would urge people to go for the Nigeria that they want for themselves. That is the Nigeria that works. And it's not going to happen by hoping that it will happen. You have to really go after in that Nigeria that you want. Okay. Yes. Well, you know, that's uh, it's, it's, it's a good note to wrap it. At least, you know, we both, we all, all three of us believe uh, that we should have uh, independent candidacy. Uh, two of us agree that we should have parliamentary uh, and unicamera. we also believe on unicamera. I believe that in my lifetime, Nigeria will be great because we will not give up and we will not stop. And my name is Naudua Konde. I'll see you again next week.